Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to give a talk here. Uh, so uh, this is a joint work, actually joint work in progress with uh, Frédéric Campana, Lionel Darando, and Erwin Rousseau. Uh, so I will speak about uh, orbifold jet differentials. So orbifolds are in the sense of Campana. Uh, they are somehow related to stacks, but uh, actually, in my context uh, here, uh, simpler to define. And uh, so what, what are the, the goals of, of this uh, lecture? Well, we want to uh, study non-constant entire curves from a complex line into a projective variety of complex numbers. And as was explained in the former weeks, uh, the variety X is said to be broadly hyperbolic if there are no such entire curves. And in, in the compact case, uh, it has been explained also, this is uh, due to the body lemma, that uh, body hyperbolicity is the same as Kobayashi hyperbolicity. And more generally, you may want to uh, study the non-compact situation, so-called logarithmic situation. So you take the complement of a divisor and by uh, Hironaka you can always desingularize and you can, after blowing up, you can replace your variety by a, another variety uh, where the divisor becomes a normal crossing divisor. And then you want to study entire curves uh, which, are, which sit in the complement of, of uh, this normal crossing divisor. So this is the picture. Okay, so uh, in green here you have the, the image of your entire curve and it completely avoids uh, the components of your divisor delta. And then the question is whether uh, such curves exist or not. And if they exist, can you uh, somehow put constraints on them and can you locate them? So we refer to such a pair x delta, where delta now is a reduced uh, divisor as a log logarithmic pair. OK, but now we want to go to an even more general situation, the so-called orbifold uh, situation in the sense of Campana. So now you take a divisor delta uh, which has arbitrary uh, coefficients, except that these coefficients are between 0 and 1. Okay. So it is here, uh, well, usually you would take uh, rational coefficients, but in this lecture, this is not even a constraint. Uh, we can even take an arbitrary real divisor. It's no, it's no problem. And then uh, rho j should be thought of as some sort of multiplicity, which is taken usually to be an integer. But as I said, that's not necessary. You can take a, just a real number. And uh, well, you assume this uh, number rho j to be at least one. Okay. So, and now you look at curves f uh, that can hit some of the components, but if, they, if the curve hits one of the components, say delta one, then you require that there is a multiplicity here which is at least row one. So of course it's more interesting when row one is an integer. And then uh, you refer to the pair x delta uh, to be an orbifold in the sense of Campana, and you assume uh, delta to be a normal crossing divisor here. And observe that the, uh, the logarithmic situation corresponds to uh, rho j being infinite. And now the, the strategy uh, that is used to study entire curves is to show that under some conditions, uh, these entire curves have to satisfy certain differential equations. Okay, so we want, we want to produce algebraic differential equations uh, that the curves have to satisfy. 
Okay, and now I uh, introduce again, well, this has been done uh, especially by Simone Diverio last week, so I will be short on uh, this definition. So you, you introduce uh, bundles of k-jets. Okay, so assume x to be non-singular. And then uh, definition of k-jets. So you, it's just uh, an equivalence relation of holomorphic curves, uh, which I write in coordinates. So if n is complex dimension, I uh, write f1, fn to be the components in some coordinates z1, zn on an open set. And then I look at the Taylor expansion of order k at the origin uh, of the complex line. So f of t is x plus t xc1 plus t squared xc2 plus etc. plus t to the k xck. And then uh, we neglect the higher order terms. And the equivalence classes of Taylor expansions are just called k jets. Okay. Uh, if you fix the, uh, the base point, uh, the, the, the origin, uh, then you get a bundle which is denoted by jk of x. Uh, then you have a projection to x which simply maps the k jet to the, uh, the origin of the curve. Okay, so this is in fact a, a bundle. And then if x is n-dimensional, you count, uh, well, you have the, uh, the point x here. And then, of course, the jets are parametrized just by uh, the coefficients of the Taylor expansion. And the coefficient of the Taylor expansion can be thought of as just vectors. Okay, so the xj, xs are now vectors in cn. And therefore, the fiber dimension here is just nk. And in fact, if you use a connection, you can uh, define Cs to be essentially 1 over s factorial times, well, you can compute the derivative by means of the connection. Of course, there is no intrinsic way of computing derivatives in the manifold. So you have to take a connection. And then you can think of this as an element in, in the fiber of the tangent bundle. Of course, it's a connection of the tangent bundle. And this way, you trivialize your, your bundle. It's somehow uh, locally, at least on the coordinate chart, it's locally isomorphic to k copies, additive copies, uh, restricted to your open set. Okay. But of course, this is not global. OK, and now uh, we introduce uh, algebraic differential operators. So you pick a k jet of curve. So it's just represented by the uh, successive derivatives. Uh, and then you have a C star action, which consists of just reparameterizing uh, time. So you delay time by a factor lambda. So you replace your curve. So this is not uh, multiplication uh, of coordinates. It's just a C star action, which consists, by definition, of reparameterizing by lambda here. And of course, if you take the derivatives of f of lambda t, the derivatives uh, get multiplied by lambda, lambda square, lambda k. So I think this has been explained last week by Simone Di Vario. Uh, and then you look at polynomials in, uh, on your k-jets. So in coordinates, they are just polynomials in xc1, xck, given by some monomials, k1, alpha1, xck, alpha k, and some coefficients, a, alpha1, alpha2, alpha k of x, which I, in the holomorphic category, I just assume to be holomorphic. Of course, if you are in an algebraic situation, you will assume that you are on a Zariski open set, and you will assume that the coefficients are rational functions. But anyway, by Gaga, it's on a projective variety. Everything is the same globally. But I will mostly work analytically. And then you have this uh, C star action. Uh, and then you have a concept of uh, weighted degree by looking at the effect of the C star action. 
And if you assume that the sum of the, uh, the degrees of your monomials here, but with s, uh, the, the, the weighted degree is m. So this weighted degree uh, actually just counts the number of primes in your monomial. So for instance, if you have a monomial, right, you take the first derivative. OK, maybe, maybe I should present the next. OK, so you can reinterpret this, of course, by plugging here the successive derivatives. You can reinterpret this polynomial now as an algebraic differential operator acting on germs of curves. OK, and if you have such a monomial here, well, say something like uh, f1 prime, f2 triple prime, and then f3 uh, to the 4, then the degree is just a number of primes. So here, the degree is 1 plus 3 plus 4, so it's 8. So this has degree 8. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, if you look at the space of these operators, you get a uh, locally uh, free uh, sheaf, the, the four vector bundle, which I denote by EKM of x, of homogeneous polynomials of weight degree m. So m refers to the degree, and k refers to the order, so number of derivatives. OK, and in this way, uh, one gets a graded algebra of differential operators. And, uh, well, it's a very trivial algebra locally. It's just, uh, just the, the ring uh, over holomorphic functions uh, generated by the components of your curves and, and their derivatives. But of course, this, the s derivative is degree s. Well, it's important to uh, realize that this bundle is definitely not a vector bundle, and it's not even an affine bundle. Uh, I mean, a fine linear bundle. Uh, because if you perform a change of coordinates, so you, you use new coordinates w by some bilomorphic change, uh, w equal to psi of z, then, of course, well, you have the Fadi Bruno formula for uh, derivatives of a composite. And then you see that it's, it's indeed linear in the top derivative, but definitely not linear in, in the lower order derivatives. Okay? So you have actually a, a sum by the differential of psi uh, of the top derivative, but then you have a, a weighted polynomial of degree s precisely in, in the lower order derivatives. And therefore, your bundle has a structure of an affine algebraic bundle, but definitely without uh, a, a vector uh, structure. But nevertheless, uh, you, have, you can count the partial degrees with respect to, uh, to the derivatives, and especially uh, the partial degree with respect to the top derivative. And this will make sense because it's just a linear change in the top derivative. So if you look at the partial degree in the top derivative, you have a concept of partial degree. And then you can take a filtration, a filtration with respect to this uh, degree. And then you get, uh, you look at the monomial in the top derivative, you, you get uh, something that you can be viewed in the symmetric product of the cotangent bundle. And then you, you repeat the operation. Then once you have filtered by the top degree, you can filter with respect to the previous degree. Uh, and then you get a huge filtration. And the graded pieces uh, of this huge multi-filtration is just this weighted sum of tensor products of the symmetric uh, powers of cotangent bundle. Now, I come to the logarithmic and uh, orbifold situations. Okay? Uh, so if you take a logarithmic pair, now with a reduced normal crossing divisor, uh, then, uh, by definition, you can take coordinates. Well, you fix a point, 
small x. And you assume that you are at a point which uh, belongs exactly to p, p components of your divisor delta. So of course, on Blackboard, I have only two dimensions. So I will draw only two components. OK, so you have your point x, which is, so you have two components, which is 2 here. And then you select your coordinates at that point so that uh, delta j is zj equals 0. And then you introduce the log differential operators exactly in the same way as before, except that for, for these components, the, the p first components, for the p-first components, you take derivatives of the logarithm, okay, not just derivative of the components. And for the other components, uh, you don't make any change. So you take derivatives of the other components. And you take polynomials in all these derivatives. And of course, you get again a graded uh, algebra which I denote now by EKM sum over M of EKM X delta. And locally, it is expressed as the ring uh, generated over holomorphic functions in terms of these expressions. And the reason is easy. Well, suppose you take the first, first derivative, first component, sorry. So of course, the derivative of this is just f1 prime over f1. But then if you take the second derivative, uh, you get f1 double prime over f1 minus f1 prime square over f1 square. And you can, of course, compute higher order derivatives. And then you see that uh, when you do this, this is the square of the first uh, logarithmic derivative. And uh, this is indeed, uh, so if you just divide, you just divide the, the all derivatives by f1, power 1. Uh, this will uh, give you an algebra that is stable by the uh, derivative, by the der derivation operator. So this is the logarithmic uh, uh, differential algebra. And of course, uh, you can do exactly the same as before. You have a multi-filtration. And then you have graded pieces. But now uh, it decomposes into a sum of tensor products of symmetric uh, powers of the logarithmic cotangent bundle. Uh, where uh, the logarithmic cotangent bundle is the locally free uh, sheaf, so vector bundle if you want, uh, which is at that point P uh, generated by dz1 over z1, dzp over zp, and dzp plus 1 dzn. Of course, the factors here play a somewhat different role because uh, this part corresponds to first order derivatives. So this is actually uh, polynomials in this. But of course, if you have order s derivatives, you, could, you should think, of course, you could take the, uh, this, but you can essentially modulo, modulo the lower order terms. You can neglect this term, okay? because somehow the leading term is this. OK, so for the, uh, for the S part here, uh, the, um, the components are actually generated by the S derivative of, well, of, Z, of Z, any component, divided by Zj. OK, for, for the P components. OK, so the, uh, the K part is for the K derivative. But anyway, you get a very simple uh, algebraic structure. And these sheaves are uh, nice because they are locally free. OK, so now I come to the orbifold situation, slightly more involved. Uh, 
Uh, actually, uh, a, there is a substantial difference, as you, as you will see. OK, so now you assume for simplicity that you have just one component because they all behave the same. So suppose uh, delta 1 is d1 equals 0. And then you require your curve f to have some multiplicity q, which is at least row 1. A row 1 is assumed to be strictly larger than 1 uh, along, along this component. Then, of course, if you take the s derivative, uh, now it vanishes at a smaller order, which is q minus s positive pi. And then you want to consider some sort of quotients of the s derivative by a power of f1. But now there is a condition, because you want this to be bounded. The crucial, the crucial property, it's a trivial property, but the crucial property that you want to, to consider in your bundles is that you are, you are going to deal with bounded uh, objects, no poles. No poles in the uh, algebraic function operators. Of course, if you have poles, you can kill them by multiplying, but this will be uh, considered later. Okay? So you don't want poles at this step. And therefore, you just count uh, the condition. So this vanishes at order q minus s positive part, and this vanishes at order beta q. So you want beta q to be at most q minus s plus. And if you divide by q, uh, you, you find that beta should be less than 1 minus s over q positive part. And therefore, because q is at least row 1, the condition that you need actually is beta less than 1 minus s over row 1. OK, so now I come to the definition. So uh, pick a point which is in the, the intersection of p components. Then the, uh, you are looking at monomials in the derivatives, but with some poles along uh, the p components, f1 to the minus beta 1, fp to the minus beta p. And then you have this condition double star uh, that actually will tell you that this expression has no, it, it will be bounded uh, given the uh, multiplicity condition on the curve. So beta j should be less than the sum from s equal 1 to k of alpha sj, 1 minus s over rho j plus, and you sum over uh, the components that go through your point x. And then you define, in, in the orbifold case, you define ekm of x delta to be the algebra uh, generated by all these uh, monomials. This works even if the rho j are real numbers. Uh, of course, if the rho j are real numbers, uh, it will be accurate only for very large degrees because for of course, uh, you have a uh, you need to take the uh, the round above uh, because you need integers for the, the beta j's because otherwise you want you want beta j is uh, should be an integer and of course when you have large integers even if you have a rho j which is a real number you will have sufficient approximation that your algebra somehow approximates very well uh, the real divisor. So you don't really care whether it's rational or real. Of course, if it's rational, if the coefficients are rational, you're going to get a locally finitely generated algebra. If the coefficients are real, it will not be even locally finitely generated. But it's not a problem. OK. Uh, one observation is that the orbifold uh, the orbifold uh, bundle, or I should have put a sum here. Well, you take the algebra. So you take the, the sum of this. It's actually a graded subalgebra of the logarithmic. OK, so I denote by uh, the, the, uh, the round uh, above here. Uh, of course, you replace the coefficients by 1, and then you are in the logarithmic case here. So when you take, when you take the round above, you get the logarithmic situation. And the, uh, the orbifold uh, algebra is contained in the logarithmic algebra. 
uh, for this reason, as geometric objects, we are, when we are in the optical situation, it's very convenient to consider the situation as embedded in the logarithmic situation. So somehow the logarithmic situation, the limit situation when the multiplicities go to infinity, and you can embed your situation in the logarithmic uh, bundles. Uh, and then exactly as before, uh, you get, well, in that case, it's just an inclusion. Uh, just an inclusion, and you have some sort of virtual uh, or before cotangent sheaf, which would be generated by these beasts here, exactly as in the logarithmic case, except that the denominators here must have smaller uh, multiplicities, which are eventually just real numbers, so it doesn't really make sense. If you want to make sense, one way is to assume that they are rational numbers. And then, if they are rational numbers, you can use a Galois covering. Uh, for some Galois covering, uh, the pullback of ZJ will become uh, actually a, a, a multiple. And then, uh, by using this multiple, you can convert this rational number into an integer. So by using an appropriate Galois cover of your variety, uh, you can eventually make sense to this uh, some sort of virtual bundle, mm, but that's somehow a bit inconvenient. I will explain later a different way, which works even for real coefficients. So you actually you don't need these Galois covers. Maybe you, maybe you could need these Galois covers in some sort of uh, strategies, but for what I'm going to, to uh, work on, this is unneeded. So at, at this point, I just think of this as somehow locally defined, locally defined only outside of the, uh, of the uh, ramification divisor. So this makes sense, of course. Outside of zj equals zero, you can select a local, uh, a local uh, uh, determination of the, of the uh, argument of the complex numbers, and this makes sense locally on some infinite uh, covering, and that's enough for us. Of course, uh, it's a fine Galois covering, uh, only a cover only if the uh, roaches are uh, rational. OK, and now, uh, well, we introduced the green Griffiths bundle. So I think this was done uh, by Simone Di Verions. Uh, so you take the, the quotient of uh, J k of x by C star which is just the part of this graded uh, algebra uh, by, by the C star action. And then there is a tautological rank one sheaf, OXK of M, which is only invertible when M is divisible by the lowest uh, common multiple of 1 to K. And you have, a, by definition, a direct image formula that EKM of X is the direct image uh, direct image of the tautological sheaf uh, okay so the situation is that you have xk here projection to x so the fibers the fibers here are weighted projective spaces Here you have the tautological sheaves, OXK of M by K here. You take the direct image, uh, you get precisely the EKM of X. Almost by definition. And of course, you can do the same in the logarithmic situation uh, because you can. Uh, use instead uh, the logarithmic uh, cotangent bundle, and you can take the proj, the proj of the uh, logarithmic uh, algebra. So uh, exactly the same for the logarithmic situation. In that case, I denote 
like this, the topological sheaves uh, on the logarithmic uh, k-jet bundle. And now, what for the orbifold situation? Well, well I will do it later. Actually, uh, what we need is some sort of geometric space. Uh, we are going to use the same geometric space as a logarithmic uh, bundle. But then uh, we don't have exactly as many, as many uh, sections because we are more demanding on the, on the degree conditions. So actually, these bundles will be twisted by a multiple ideal sheaf. So uh, the orbital situation just means actually that we are twisting the logarithmic tautological sheaves by an asymptotic sequence of multiple ideal sheaves. So this will be the idea. OK, now I come to the, uh, the big conjectures. So uh, the big conjectures is that if you have an orbital of general type, in the sense that k plus delta is a big uh, divisor, maybe a real divisor, uh, then there should be a proper algebraic variety y and x containing all orbifold entire curves. So the ones that are satisfy the multiplicity conditions. And of course, uh, well, it's even in the absolute case, even when delta is zero, uh, it's still a conjecture. So the, uh, the idea is you, you want to produce a lot of algebraic differential equations for the curves. And hopefully, if there are enough differential equations, you can eliminate derivatives and produce algebraic equations and produce your uh, sub variety y. Uh, for this, you rely on the uh, fundamental vanishing theorem, which can be stated as follows in the general situation. So you fix an ample divisor A on X, and then you look at the global jet differential operators X delta, so even in the orbifold situation, okay. even in the orbifold case. Uh, but you assume that coefficients vanish on your ample divisor. So you remember that you have some these coefficients A, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha k uh, of X. So you assume that all these coefficients vanish on uh, the ample divisor A. Then automatically, automatically uh, your orbifold curve has to be a solution of uh, this global operators P. So I think. Uh, this has been proved last week, uh, at least in the absolute case. Uh, maybe not in the logarithmic or orbital case. OK, so let me just mm, give a very, recall very shortly how it, this is proved. So actually, uh, you can use body theorem. And body theorem somehow reduces the situation to the case of body curves. So you fix a, a Hermitian metric omega on x. And then uh, one basic case is when the curve has bounded derivative throughout the complex line. So you assume that f prime is, is bounded in terms of the metric omega. And then by raising uh, p, OK, so you, you have a section p here, which is a global, a global differential operator. And by raising p to p to the a, say, or more, more beta, say p to the beta, then you are, you are in O of minus beta a. And then you can assume that a is very ample. OK, so you assume a very ample. And you view as a differential operator with coefficient vanishing on a. Then by the Cauchy inequalities of uh, one variable, all the derivatives are bounded. And therefore, if you plug this in P, because all derivatives are bounded, you get a bounded function on the complex line. And then by UV's theorem, it has to be constant. But on the other hand, because the coefficients vanish on the ample, very ample divisor A, uh, this, 
this function that is constant has to vanish as well. Well, yeah, there's a small argument because, of course, it might be it might be that you have your ample A and that the curve doesn't doesn't eat A. But of course, because A is very ample, you can move in a linear system and take some other member, and then uh, some other member will hit the curve, and then uh, the function will vanish. Well, this is the proof. OK. Uh, and then in the logarithmic and orbifold cases, well, you are going to do essentially the same, except that now, instead of taking a Hermitian metric on x, you have to take uh, an orbifold metric in the sense of, uh, well, that will be explained uh, in other lectures this week, uh, you have to, in the sense of Donaldson, an orbifold, uh, say, Keller metric uh, that, uh, that has precisely, uh, that is, corresponds to the uh, orbifold divisor delta. So you, you just do the same proof but with an orbifold uh, metric instead. And the proof just goes the same. Well, it's a little bit tricky, but I, you can also, uh, if you don't assume that you have a body curve, you can use the L-force lemma with uh, L-force lemma together with an orbifold metric. And then once you have it, uh, well, it's just a matter of a little bit of algebra. So I will skip that. And now the next, uh, the next idea that already occurred uh, well, in the PhD thesis of uh, Simone Di Verio uh, about 12 years ago uh, is that a crucial tool for this uh, theory is to use holomorphic Morse inequalities. So you take, uh, it's a very general theorem for uh, any compact complex manifold that I proved uh, in 1985. And this was improved uh, by Laurent Bonavero in his PhD thesis in 96 for the case of singular metric. So you take uh, L equipped with an arbitrary Hermitian uh, metric, which is possibly singular, H equal exponential minus phi, which is assumed to have analytic singularities on some uh, algebraic set sigma, say, or analytic set sigma. And then you take the curvature. The curvature is just the current. Uh, you don't assume much. It's not necessarily positive. You can have arbitrary uh, signature, any number of positive and negative eigenvalues. And then you look at the signature precisely of, of the, the current, theta of x, at any point. So you assume uh, it has analytic security, so it means uh, it is smooth outside of an analytic set. Okay. So if the, the weight uh, phi here is, is just smooth outside of an analytic set. And then you compute the signature, and you look at uh, the Q chamber. So the Q chamber is the open set where you have signature n minus Q, Q. So this is number of positive and negative eigenvalues. And then this is the union of chambers up to level Q. Then a uh, conclusion is that the alternate sum of dimensions of cohomology groups twisted by multiple ideal sheaves is controlled by the Morse integral. So it's some sort of extension of the riemann rohr formula, but the riemann rohr formula gives you control only on the Euler characteristic, and the morphic Morse inequalities give you control on all individual cohomology groups. But of course, you need more information. You need information on the curvature. And here, uh, these are the, the nadal multiply yield sheaves, uh, which take into account the singularities of your metric. Uh, so you, uh, these are coherent sheaves, and you have a sequence of coherent sheaves. And a consequence, you just apply to q equal 1. So then you get a, a lower bound for the number of sections. Because h0 is larger than h0 minus h1, of course. But then, by the Morse inequalities, by reversing signs, 
you just see that this number of sections admits a lower bound, which is this Morse integral that, in principle, can be computed. And here, uh, this is, a, as I said, an arbitrary uh, real 1-1 one, one form. And an interesting special case is when the theta is expressed as a difference alpha minus beta of positive sem or semi-positive forms. Because in that case, you have a very simple uh, lemma on uh, elementary symmetric functions and uh, the binomial formula that tells you that uh, the characteristic function of, of this set multiplied by alpha minus beta to the n is bounded below by alpha to the n minus n alpha to the n minus 1 which beta. So the first two terms of the binomial expansion. So a very simple algebraic lemma. And therefore, you get uh, this uh, lower bound for uh, dimension of the space of sections in terms of the two components, alpha and beta, of the curvature. But alpha and beta should, should be here uh, non-negative. OK, so now I'm going to apply this to, the, uh, to all these uh, bundles, k-jet bundles. So this is an idea that I somehow developed. Uh, well, this started with uh, Simone Di Verio's PhD thesis, but then the general case was achieved in 2010, a paper of mine. Uh, and then there's been a lot of improvements, so uh, I'm going to detail the last improvement that we obtained a couple of weeks ago. Okay. So um, what you need, of course, you need a metric. Now, to compute this thing, you need a metric here. So let's take the ve very simple case where delta is 0. So when delta is 0, so if no, no orbifold divisor, uh, you simply take a metric on the tangent bundle, and then you evaluate the norm of the derivatives with respect to this metric, fix any connection, any smooth connection works. Of course, you don't have a holomorphic connection in general. Just take an arbitrary smooth connection. Of course, it can be terrible. Because you, you have possibly to use partitions of unity to produce a, uh, a C infinity connection. Anyway, just do it. Uh, and take a Hermitian metric. Then you have to raise the norms to these exponents so essentially 1 over s, because you have the c star action, and you want this norm to be uh, invariant by the c star action. And then it is important to put here coefficients that decay very fast. So the, uh, the coefficient for the higher derivatives is very small compared to the first coefficient. The reason is that you need this awful uh, partition of unity, and this would be completely impossible to compute in general. But it turns out that when you rescale that way, uh, the formula becomes independent of the partition of unity asymptotically. So, in fact, uh, you can replace this connection by any good connection, and locally you can use a homomorphic connection. So it, it's looked like a miracle, but it's deeply related, as was observed by Benoit Cadorel recently, it's deeply uh, related to uh, some sort of semi-continuity of the alternate sums of cohomology in a deformation. And so here, what you are doing, this deformation by the epsilon, is some sort of deformation of a non-split exact sequence in the graded pieces of the bundle to a split exact sequence. Uh, this fits exactly, uh, by this paper of mine in 86, in 96, uh, uh, it's just compatible with the uh, holomorphic Morse inequalities. So in, in the more holomorphic Morse inequalities and this rescaling, you can completely ignore the, the fact that the extensions are non-split, that you have a uh, filtration which is non-split, and so on, 
from the viewpoint of holomorphic Morse inequalities, everything will become split. So it's, uh, it's fantastic. Well. And uh, then, well, it turns out that the expression now uh, because becomes just a sum of computable terms. Uh, now you can compute the curvature of this thing. Uh, what you get is that the curvature, the curvature of your bundle here, splits completely in various terms. So first you have the vertical, the vertical derivatives. But the vertical derivatives, you are on O of 1. Well, if you would be in protective space, it would be just the usual Fubinich 2D metric. Here, it's not the Fubinich 2D because you have a weighted protective space, so you get instead a weighted Fubinich 2D metric. So this is what is denoted here, omega FSK. It's just the analog of the Fubinich 2D metric, but with weighted protective space. And it is, of course, a positive term. And then uh, the miracle, again, is that all the remaining terms in the curvature are depend on just on this Hermitian metric that you take on the tangent bundle. Uh, so your S is the order of derivative, okay? And you have a sum of the curvature coefficients of your um, of the cotangent bundle with respect to this metric. But you have a weighted sum, and because you have coefficient 1 over s here, uh, you have weight 1 over s here. And, well, this is because of differentiation of a logarithm, uh, so you, you have these terms. Just a very small, uh, easy uh, calculation of derivative of a, of a logarithm and Taylor expansion. Okay, so it's nothing deep here. So this is uh, the expression. It's a little bit involved. And so, uh, just to simplify, we use polar coordinates. So instead, the norm, well, the, the weighted norm, you denote by excess. And then uh, the unit vector, so this is the S derivative. So you take the unit vector US, it's just the unit vector pointing in the direction of the S derivative of your curve. Okay, just this. And now, in this polar coordinates, the expression becomes better. So you have still the, uh, the, the vertical Fubinich 2D term. And then you have the curvature of your tangent, cotangent bundle taken on each of these unit vectors. You take the sum, but you have a weight here, which is 1 over s excess. So now it becomes tractable. And now what you want to do is to compute these Morse integrals. And if you are able to compute these Morse integrals and get them to be positive, then you are done. Because by the holomorphic Morse inequalities, you are going to prove the existence of a global uh, differential operators. And therefore, you get your differential equations. OK, so there are several ways. The first thing is you are using the binomial formula, and this is positive term, does doesn't doesn't have any influence on the index, just a positive term. So the the negative terms come from just from the horizontal sum. Okay, so they somehow all the complexity all the complexity of the uh, of the of the jet bundle now somehow is reduced to something that is just on the base. Well, except it's on the base, except that it is weighted by points. Of course, the x u here, you are, you are in polar coordinates. So the point here depends on x and u. So the, the positivity is along the, the horizontal direction, but depends on the point of the fiber.
and you have to integrate on the on the big uh, on a big uh, bundle uh, because uh, protective space is essentially a quotient of a sphere you can assume that you are the sum of excess here is one just as the protective space is a quotient of a sphere by the circle, uh, circle okay so now you have to integrate this And the signature depends only on this, which is a sum of actually quadratic forms. And you have to average over the, uh, the simplex. Uh, so this is not divisor. It's, it's a k minus 1 simplex. So sum of excess is 1. And you have to compute, uh, well, the, uh, the vertical Fubini studi, well, this is a simple calculation, just the universal formula. And then you have to evaluate more cynicals with respect to products of spheres. Because uh, you have unit vectors, and you have to compute a big integral on the product of spheres. Um, this is actually a Monte Carlo integral in the sense of physicists. So you're, somehow you're considering uh, jets as a, uh, as a random variable. And you're picking an arbitrary jet means picking arbitrary derivatives. And now you're picking somehow arbitrary points on the unit sphere, and you have to compute a huge uh, integral. And somehow you, you have to evaluate a Monte Carlo integral by fine approximation. And it converges to the integral by, well, physicists know this very well. Uh, you, you make random experiments, and then it converges to the average. Okay. Uh, but then you have a weighted average. Uh, so actually, you have this weight coming in. But then it converges to the integral of the quadratic form. But the integral of a quadratic form is just a trace. Um, because you take the trace of this, now, uh, instead of the full curvature tensor, you have the trace of the curvature tensor. But the trace of the curvature tensor is just the curvature of the canonical bundle. If you take the, tr you have the curvature tensor of any vector bundle. If you have usual formula, is that if you take the trace with respect to the uh, to a metric on E of a of the curvature tensor of a vector bundle, what you get is the curvature of the determinant, so a line bundle, with respect to the induced metric that H. So it means that you don't actually, asymptotically, when k goes to infinity, instead of having to deal with the full curvature tensor, you only have to deal with the curvature of the canonical bundle. And that is somehow the explanation why the canonical go bundle co governs everything in this sort of, of theory. Because you have probabilistic uh, convergence uh, to, uh, in the sense of this Monte Carlo process, uh, and everything is governed by the canonical bundle. And then, well, of course, you have to estimate the deviation, and that, that's a non trivial L2 estimate. Uh, I will completely skip that. That was the main effort, actually, to be overcome. You have to estimate the deviation, and actually, it converges very, very slowly. So let me. Uh, State the theorem. So you fix A, an ample line bundle. Take any Hermitian structures on the tangent bundle and on A. Of course, A, you take a metric with positive curvature. And then you introduce that line bundle. So you take the topical one and you twist it. You want something negative. So you twist it by this, this uh, rational number for some reason. And then you look at the lower bounds for the multiples. So it means that you compute the sections of EKM of x, but twisted by a negative multiple of a. This is good. This is what you want. In fact, this will become large. You would need only minus a, but in fact, you can get even for large multiples. And then you, get an, you compute what I, I explained, and you get an explicit lower bound in terms of eta epsilon. And eta epsilon is just the difference 
between the curvature of the canonical bundle of X and epsilon times the curvature of A. And of course, if A is epsilon is small, then this can be taken arbitrarily small. But if you want to, to subtract something very large, of course, uh, you have to subtract more in the curvature. But if kx is ample, or even big, then uh, you can expect this to be uh, positive. And then here, the c over log k is the deviation in the Monte Carlo process, unfortunately. Well, c can be controlled. It's a constant that can be expressed in terms of the churn classes. So you, you have some sort of control on the, on the deviation. But uh, it's a little bit involved, so I would not explain that here. And then uh, if kx is big, you get uh, your lower bound. Uh, and this is completely computable. You can estimate k because um, you, know, you know what is c. And in fact, you can get better because you just don't get uh, the holomorphic Morris inequalities. They control not just H0, but all HQs. So you can get lower bounds for the HQ, upper bounds for the HQ. And you get a good control of all commodity groups. And usually they are not zero. So you cannot expect the commodity groups to be zero. You can expect them to be small. OK. And then you have the non-probability. Uh, this the problem with this is that you have to take m and k extremely large, and uh, for the obvious cases, it's not good, uh, as I will explain. So then you have a non-probabilistic approach, which consists of assuming some sort of lower bound, the cotangent bundle. So you you assume that you know. A, uh, somehow a, a lower bound for the curvature of the cotangent bundle, which I denote by gamma. And of course, if you are in protective space, in fact, it's very easy to see that if x is embedded in Pn, you can simply take gamma to be twice the Fubini Studi metric. It's a very standard lemma uh, for some variety of protective space. The, uh, Negativity can no, never go down. So minus two is it's minus two, not more. And then uh, you uh, redo uh, the the Morse calculation, but now you don't use probability theory. You just apply the lemma with the difference alpha minus beta. So now you have, the, you have your alpha, and the, and the beta comes from the negative part here. So you know what is alpha and beta, and you compute the integral, and you get this. And, and you recognize here the alpha to the n, and here the alpha to the n minus 1, and here the beta term. And the beta term involves the negative part gamma here. And now you see that you have a chance of getting this integral to be positive. Because here the, the, the nth power, the nth power of the canonical bundle, and here in the negative term, only the n minus 1 power. So if kx is very large in terms of degree, of course, uh, the, the nth power will be larger than the n minus 1 power. So now, of course, you lose this probabilistic approach, but you gain the fact that you have a completely explicit uh, lower bound, and you can compute this. And the constant here, again, is uh, completely explicit. OK, now I come, uh, well, briefly enough, to the logarithmic and orbifold situation. So in the logarithmic situation, essentially nothing is changed, because you can apply exactly the same technique. The only change is that you have to replace the uh, cotangent bundle by the logarithmic cotangent bundle. And then exactly the same formula, but instead of the canonical bundle, you have the canonical bundle of the logarithmic pair. So you have to use kx plus delta. Essentially, no change. And so you have the, uh, the probabilistic estimate unchanged, and the non-probabilistic estimate. Uh, the only change, of course, is that you have to use kx plus delta instead. 
Now I come to the uh, orbifold case. OK, so now you consider uh, orbifold in the sense of Campana. And then uh, you have to use different Finstar metrics. Uh, so the, the metrics now are more involved because you have to compute uh, a norm that takes into account the multiplicities. And this is exactly, this is exactly locally, well, in, in a model case, this is the formula for the Finstler metric. And somehow it corresponds, it corresponds to the same calculation and the one I've done in the absolute case, but I have to replace the, uh, the cotangent bundle by this virtual whole before cotangent bundle that I have uh, defined, except uh, it's not the same depending on the derivative. In the absolute case or in the logarithmic case, you have the same vector bundle for all derivatives. But because in the orbifold situation, when you take the S derivative, the multiplicity decreases, and therefore the orbifold condition decreases for the order of the derivative, meaning that you don't have here the same the same weights when the order of derivative increases. And therefore, you should introduce the order S or default uh, cotangent bundle, which depends on the order of derivative and is given precisely by these weights. And then up to this change, uh, well, essentially, uh, you get the same results. So, but you don't have the probabilistic estimate because you see that when s goes to infinity, when s goes to infinity, uh, you reach zero here, which means that if you let the order go to infinity, in fact, you come back to the, to the non-logarithmic case. You come back to the absolute case where the components are zero. So you don't gain, you don't gain anything by letting k go into infinity. So you need to fix k. So when k is fixed, and actually the smallest possible value is k equal to dimension. Uh, so the interesting case is k is called uh, dimension. And then you still get uh, a, 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 an integral condition for uh, the jets to exist, which is given by this formula, uh, exactly the same numbers. And if you apply this to projective space, OK, uh, you have the same bound. So this is a completely universal bound. The uh, curvature is always bounded by minus 2 times uh, the curvature of O of 1. And then you can take, for instance, a multiplicity or before multiplicity to be n plus 1, because you need the nth derivative to be uh, again, uh, zero on the components. And you compute in this case, and you get that for degree large enough, explicit lower bound, then you do have a lot of sections in the orbifold situation. So you get hyperbolicity for curves uh, avoiding a number of, well, avoiding or hitting the components, but with uh, sufficient multiplicity. Uh, these curves will be solutions of differential equations. And now you can also, well, in the case of foliations, you could uh, introduce uh, even more general situation where you have somehow a foliation plus a, an orbifold structure. So you consider in that case curves that are tangent to a uh, distribution or a foliation and that hit components with certain multiplicities. And again, uh, now you have uh, orbifold directed structures. So you have sub somehow the foliation or, or the directed structure will give you some, some sort of uh, orbifold uh, directed structures for which you can apply, again, the Morse inequalities. And you are going to get uh, very precise integral conditions for the existence of sections here. OK, I'm already beyond time, so uh, well. We'll stop here.